uh, theme um, of energy, energy security, with a very uh, another of our very special speakers, uh, Admiral Gary Roughhead. Uh, he he has just very recently retired as chief of naval operations. Um, as is he. Uh, was responsible for all the operations of the Navy. Um, he was a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 38 years uh, in the Naval Service. Uh, it's just a very impressive career. Many functions uh, for those of us who are academics. We note that he was commandant of the Naval Academy at one time. Uh, for those of us who are interested in policy, he, he serves as the Navy's liaison to Congress for two and a half years. Uh, now he's uh, moved to a third career, and we'll talk about the first one earlier. Uh, we'll talk about the, the earlier first career at a later point. He's now at the Hoover Institution as an uh, Annenberg Fellow who's addressing national security issues. He's been, I've, I've been uh, very fortunate to hear his insightful comments as he serves as a member of the uh, Hoover Energy Task Force, a, a task force um, that's chaired by uh, Secretary uh, George Schultz. Um, he's an avid bicyclist and uh, now, as I said, become uh, an important member of our community. I'd like to just have a conversation with him. Um, but I want to start with a rumor I heard. And it had something to do with an earlier career. I understand you used to be involved in play with the ponies, uh, it's sort of a, a jockey. Riding horses. Now, you don't actually look no. like you could be a jockey right now, but is, so is there any truth to this rumor that I've heard? There is, Jim, and uh, I lay claim to being the only naval officer that ever made money as a jockey. Um, that said, as you look at me, I have to confess that I probably violated every child labor law on the books when I was doing it um, in a much younger and much smaller frame. But... Uh, it was a lot of fun. Where was that? That was in the Middle East, in Iran. Um, I had the privilege of living there for many years. Uh, my father was in the oil industry and spent 50 years in the Middle East. So uh, from my earliest days, I've been in the energy business, so to speak. Uh, was horse racing the same there? Or were the rules a little bit? What was it like? Uh, uh, rules was an unknown term at the time uh, <laughs> because many of the races involved the tribes that would come in from the hills and, and for them the purses were quite large uh, and in many instances the whips were not being used on the horses so it was uh, pretty sporty. <laughs> so you learned about the fence early on. Exactly. And that's, you moved you into uh, right. another defense career. Exactly. Um, so the Navy, um, energy efficiency, renewables, what are you doing? Yeah, I, I think the Navy's story and, and the military writ large uh, and what we're doing with regard to energy uh, is, is a good story. Uh, but it's more than a story. It's, it's, it's fact-based. And um, for me, uh, as I took up my last position as the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, it became apparent to me that uh, we were living in different times, uh, that there were changes that were taking place globally that really needed a look, a different look at, at how we saw our future. And uh, early on, I established two task forces. I'm not a task force type of person. I prefer to make an organization work as opposed to band-aid uh, ad hoc groups that, that can generate activity, maybe give you a sense that things are moving in the right direction. But um, there were two areas that I thought required a focus 
outside of the inertia of, of the institution itself. So I created two task forces. One was on climate change, uh, because I think if you look at what's happening to the planet, uh, the changes that are taking place, it forecasts uh, the challenges that we're going to have with resources, uh, humanitarian issues, uh, and, 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 and changes in the nature of things, such as commerce. For example, when the Arctic opens for commerce in about 20 or 25 years, it fundamentally changes the trade routes of the planet. Uh, it opens up vast energy resources. And we haven't had an event like that since the, last of the, uh, since the end of the last ice age. Uh, it's a big deal. And, and I thought it needed some fresh thinking, some focused thinking, uh, and some long-term planning as to what we intended as a Navy to do about it. With regard to energy, throughout my career, there have been, as Bill Perry pointed out, uh, uh, fits and starts on our seriousness of, uh, about energy. And, and that was reflected in the Navy, because you can imagine whenever the president says energy is important, uh, it becomes obsessive for everybody in the government uh, for a period of time. So, uh, you know, I saw that, but in thinking back over my career, I saw the efforts being pretty superficial. Uh, I often said that you know, our energy uh, initiative was to put a label over the light switch in every room that said turn off lights before leaving room. Uh, but it really didn't get to the, the, to the big things. So um, I also looked at what the total operating costs would be for our Navy 20 years down the road. Uh, and when I looked at those, I realized that I was delivering to my successors, many times removed, a Navy that would be unaffordable for the American people. So when you look at and you break that down, it really falls into two main categories. Energy costs, which are huge for the types of systems uh, that we buy, and, uh, and then the cost of people which are continuing to grow. And so you know, we were dealing with the people issues. Uh, but I really wanted a good focus on energy. And so we put in place the task force. We looked at what should we be doing. And when you look at the military, whether it's the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, Air Force, um, you can't simply say we need a more energy efficient um, pick the service and flush that down the drain and create a new one. So you have to look at it in terms of that which you already have, which in the case of the Navy, the capital investments we make last 35, 40 years. USS Enterprise, our first nuclear aircraft carrier, is on its last mission in Afghanistan as we speak. Its first mission was the Cuban Missile Crisis. 52 years of service. That's a good investment, I would say, for the country. And I would also say, from an energy standpoint, a huge investment, a uh, good investment for the country. Uh, so you, but you have to look at that which you have, and then that which you want to have in the future. And then in the case of all of the services, you look at that which goes forward, and that infrastructure that you keep behind to keep uh, that machine working. And so I kind of thought of it in four quadrants. Uh, the operational, or the term of art we use is the tactical and then um, the non-tactical, meaning all the infrastructure, and then you break it into the old and the new. And the investments are different for each one. Uh, with the old, we looked at how can we really make a difference in how much energy we're consuming. Um, and, and we found, as you get into this, uh, a large part of it, to Mitzi's point earlier, um, you know, so much about driving change is really cultural. I maintain that the technical is easy, the policy is probably the hardest, and then the cultural is just a grinding effort that you have to put in and find ways to change people's thinking uh, about it. So uh, the reason I mention that is some of the first comments were, well, if you do this on this ship, you're only going to save 2% in fuel costs over the lifetime. So you look at large fuel usage, 
you look at a long lifetime, 2% on every ship begins to add up to a big number. And, and so we started really looking at the math, which oftentimes, I think, in our discussions within the government, we're so superficial. We talk in generalities, and then we give very general guidance. You have to get into the details and really look at how you want to drive your investments. Um, so we did things, uh, for example, on very large ships. We put stern flaps, much like you see the trim tabs on, on some of the power boats that, that buzz around the bay. Uh, it saves about 2 to 3% in fuel costs over the lifetime of the ship. We um, changed out lighting systems and went to LED lighting. We put in place continuous water washing of gas turbine engines, and you increase the efficiency of those engines. And so we started putting that into place. Uh, a little more boldly, we dropped in uh, a hybrid drive into one of our large amphibious ships because warships need power and speed, but they don't need it all the time. But yet we design a power plant that has it available all the time. And your fuel consumption shows that. So by putting in the hybrid drive, for example, on this new ship that we built, uh, maiden voyage from the building yard in Mississippi to San Diego, uh, the fuel cost was $1 million less than the previous ship of that class that had been built. We estimate, estimate that over the lifetime of a ship in current dollars, uh, the hybrid drive is going to save us about a quarter of a billion dollars per ship. Uh, begins to add up. So, you know, those are some of the things that, that, that we were doing there. On the shore side, or the non-tactical side, uh, photovoltaics. Uh, the Navy runs the lar two largest government photovoltaic fields in the country. Um, wind. Uh, we have a wind farm in Guantanamo Bay where we have a very important uh, naval base there, strategically important. Uh, divorce that from your thinking about the detention facility. Uh, Guantanamo Bay is an important uh, place for us in this hemisphere. Uh, but that's helpful. San Clemente Island off the coast here, we put wind in there um, to power the facilities that we have on that island. Uh, and we took advantage of some of the Recovery Act money to add more solar, more wind, uh, because I was, as, the, as in my position, I was always, always looking for other people's money to spend. And so we could get that, and then we could apply it. Um, so those were, were some of the things that we did there. But then we also looked at where do we want to go in the future. And it was clear to us, for operational reasons, uh, as well as for environmental reasons, um, that we wanted to really uh, move into, the, into biofuels uh, because we wanted the flexibility, we wanted the cleanness, uh, and again, this was something we hadn't done before. And we challenged ourselves a bit. We looked at um, the inventory that we had and said, okay, what would it take to prove all of this out? And uh, we looked at one of our uh, frontline fighter jets that we fly off of our aircraft carriers, and the objective was set. We want to fly this airplane supersonically on biofuels. Excuse me. And when the question was asked, how long would that take? It was it'd take about two years to get there. Um, that sounded like a good number, so I halved it uh, and told my staff that from this day, you have less than one year to fly uh, a Hornet on biofuels. We called it the Green Hornet. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I got the one year. <laughs> but I couldn't get the aviators to let me paint it green. They, they just <laughs> dug in on that one. Um, shortly after that, uh, we flew the Blue Angels air demonstration team on biofuels. And if you have anyone that questions performance, watch that demonstration team in action flying on biofuels, and you get a performance test the likes of which you've never seen before. We then dropped it into our helicopters. We dropped it into our ships. And we set a goal that by 2012, that we would sail uh, a green task group uh, made up of ships and airplanes in our Navy. Uh, we have the benefit of being able to use some nuclear because 17% of the Navy is nuclear with our submarines and aircraft carriers. 
Um, that demonstration is taking place in Hawaii as we speak um, as part of the largest international naval exercise in history uh, called Rim of the Pacific Exercise that's now kicking off. Uh, and I might add, for the first time, the Russians are there with us. Uh, so it's a great opportunity, not just for us to proof this concept, but also to let other countries who are there see the art of the possible uh, and perhaps uh, see opportunities, but move them in that right direction. So those are some of the things that we've done. I think when you look at what the Air Force is doing, and the Air Force is the largest consumer of energy uh, within the Department of Defense, um, they fully realize the need to become more energy efficient, which, what they're, which, with, with, which is what they are doing, uh, both ashore and with their fleet, and they too are, are working the biofuel issue with us. Uh, the Army and Marine Corps uh, are looking at other aspects of what needs to be done to uh, become more efficient, to become lighter, and to become more expeditionary. And I highlight those three things for the entrepreneurs in the audience. Lighter, more efficient, and more uh, distributed. Uh, the technologies that, that allow them to do that are going to become extraordinarily important. Um, and we see it in some of the things that have been done in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as I mentioned at a previous conference here, combat has a way of focusing people. And when you want to talk about how to change a culture, um, combat can do that. Uh, the young man or woman that has to drive a fuel convoy uh, which means that every time they get in that car and go out, or in that truck and go outside the wire, that there is a probability that they will not come back. Uh, people become very serious about saving energy to minimize the number of convoys that have to run. Um, to be able to put more distributed power in place so that remote outposts can subsist and sustain themselves on solar, maybe wind, uh, maybe local biomass, so that you're not having to run the trucks out back and forth to that remote outpost. So those are areas that are going to be extraordinarily important uh, as we go forward. So I hope I've touched on some things that may be of interest. Great. Well, there's so many things to follow up on. Uh, let me start with one. I have a, uh, a fairly simple view of a of a ship, I'm sure it's much right. more complicated. But it's a combination of a large transport vehicle, a weapon system, and a hotel. Exactly. And those three sort of fit together and they, they use up, up the energy. I heard you talking more about what you can do for the um, system of the, the transport vehicle, the, how about the hotel, the, 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 a whole group of sailors who are there making decisions themselves right. in the hotel? Uh, any, what are the things that you're doing in that function? And then later, and you can put in, is there something that's happening in the weapons system as right. well that, that will be relevant? Yeah. Uh, thanks for that question. I, um, and I think that gets to areas of potential pursuit for those who are, are looking for uh, uh, some technology solutions. Um, as, as Jim said, the ships are extraordinarily complex. Um, and, and, and so you, you do have the problem of pushing it through the water. And uh, you know, navies, for, from the beginning of time, have relied on energy. Uh, you know, they say an army moves on its stomach, a fleet uh, moves on energy. Uh, I mean, even back to the Roman galleys, you know, the, the, there was this exchange between two galley slaves when they got up in the morning. And one said to the other, good news and bad news for the day, Claudius. Uh, the good news is we're going to get a two-hour energy conservation break this morning. The bad news is the captain wants to water ski after lunch. <laughs> um, so, um, so we're looking at, you know, how do you move it through the water? Um, 
But then once you start getting into how people live, you're talking about lighting, you're talking about cooling, you're talking about preparing meals constantly on a ship. So how do you um, make things more efficient in that regard? Talked about um, uh, going to LED, uh, which uh, brings down the energy cost markedly. Um, can you become more efficient in your uh, heating and ventilation and air conditioning systems that you have on board? Uh, so we're looking at what's the best way to do that. How can you design a ship that maybe you don't have to heat and cool as much of it uh, in the same, you know, uh, from the same power sources? And, and then once you get into what I call the working end of the ship, and it doesn't make any difference if it's a, uh, an amphibious ship that's responsible for putting the Marines uh, across the beach, or our very advanced uh, missile defense ships, power is extraordinarily important. And uh, how can you uh, reduce the power that's consumed? How can you reduce the cooling that's required? Because with these large radars that we operate, you're generating a lot of heat. You have to remove that heat from the system in order for it to perform properly. Um, I was just down in Australia where there was a fascinating company down there that uh, took something that, that as I looked at it and recalled my days of having built a ship with similar capability, uh, large rooms and, and a vast amount of equipment required uh, to provide the same detection capability out of a radar, um, and that had all been reduced down to about 20th of the size. So, you know, how can we take the technology that exists and bring it into uh, the military and think differently about how we might be able to apply it? I think the other thing that comes into play uh, during the period that we are about to enter, and make no mistake about the fact that um, the budgets are going to get extraordinarily tight here in the coming, I'll say, decade, um, and uh, that there will be, I believe, renewed interest in how can we take cost out of uh, what we do. And recall what I said about the old and the new. Uh, all too often, everyone wants to look, about, look to the new, but I believe that there will be significant interest in how can I go back and retrofit or change uh, the systems that we have in the fleet today so that I can save money on energy, that I can save money perhaps on maintainability and reliability because I may not have to have as many people. And I think everyone here in the room would agree that people, costs are where the real money is as well. Uh, so what technologies can be brought to bear uh, to produce those types of savings in, in power and in lighting and heating and cooling and simply in, in ways that people live on the ship. For example, um, if you were to go on board one of our older ships, you'd go in where they prepare all the meals and there are steam kettles and uh, ovens and there's a lot of energy going into what we call a galley, whether it's in the form of thermal energy in the steam or electric power. If you go on one of our newer ships, we're moving to pre-prepared meals, um, which is a cultural shift, uh, as you would expect for the Navy, but more efficient ovens to heat them quickly. So again, you're not using as much energy. And so those are the types of things that I think would be extraordinarily helpful. Now, I want to make sure I get it right, because listening to the many things you're doing, it seems like there's really three goals that you, you've been pursuing at the bottom line. Goal one, you think moving in this direction will be part of a big trend that will improve our national security. Goal two, you want to reduce the cost of, of running the Navy from what it would have been otherwise. And goal three, you want to make it a more effective fighting force. Absolutely. Uh, is that right, or is, did I miss any goals, or is those are the no. three goals that really are driving yeah. everything? That you're the doing? only thing I would do, Jim, is I'd kind of reverse uh, the last item you mentioned and move it to the first, because <clears throat> at the end of the day, the American people want a Navy, a Marine Corps, an Air Force, uh, an Army that's an effective fighting force, um, and and all too often you can get in debates. Um, on 
many sides of the spectrum uh, that, that were trying to become efficient um, and, and that were sacrificing effectiveness for efficiency. And my point is that if you are efficient, you are more effective. If, if I can bring down power uh, costs and power requirements, if I can uh, put components in place that are smaller, take less power, that also opens up other opportunities within that container that we call a ship or a tank uh, or a truck, whatever it may be. And so, uh, you know, any time I get into the efficiency versus effectiveness discussion, uh, I think it's important that, that they be fused together because they, they go forward together uh, and they are not separate and distinct. So, uh, being, uh, being effective is what it's all about. Thank you. Um, can we turn a little bit more to the shore facilities? Because right. um, here you, you have, again, this combination. But you have physical facilities that are set up. And then you have people who are there on the bases who are doing things. Could you talk about some of the, the initiatives? I mean, one of the things I found very interesting is the uh, experimental work that is changing the incentives for a reduction of, of energy on, on, um, in, in living quarters uh, by having financial incentives. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit yeah. that, about the shore? Yeah. I, I think um, you know, all too often, as you look back over the, the uh, government facilities, and, uh, and I'll go even beyond the military facilities, that uh, for m almost everyone, uh, energy was just not an issue. Uh, that was done by you know, somebody else. Well, uh, it wasn't until I was in a position in the Navy where I was writing the checks for it that I got a, you know, this, this passionate interest in uh, having to deliver on uh, more efficient bases. Uh, and part of our problem was that we didn't know exactly how much we were using, who was using it, and for what purpose it was being used. And so the idea of uh, measuring and metering uh, is, is a big deal because it allows us to get in and better understand what is going on and to drive the behavior and to drive the culture. Uh, because uh, people in the military tend to be competitive they tend to be a little on the type A side. So when uh, you inject competition or you uh, are able to set measurable goals, you'll find that, that people in the military you know, like that. They thrive on it. You know, it's just a cultural thing. Um, and so by doing that, we have been able to bring some costs down. And San Diego, which was the first port that we put individual ship meters on, Commanding officers are now aware of how much they're using. And, and I would tell you that if uh, Jim and I are together for a beer at the end of the day, and he tells me that he's using less energy than I am, chances are I'm going to say, well, watch this. And, and we'll go you know, get into a little bit of a, a competition. But what we also have done is in our residential areas uh, within the military, we've started a metering process there, which uh, initially caused a little bit of a stir, again, because of that culture of you know, energy is something that I just get and use, uh, to one where our families now were having to pay attention, but we incentivized it. If they used over what uh, the established average was, they paid. If they used under, they got a rebate. Um, and in the first year where we did the pilot in Hawaii, uh, we brought residential use down 10%. Um, maybe not a large number, but it had never moved before. And I would submit with uh, the change in the power behavior and, and, and uses that we now have in our homes uh, that tends to drive it up, bring it down 10% in one year, uh, I thought that was a good thing. And and, and, and we will take that and put it into other areas. Um, 
The other thing that has been very helpful to us in our residential areas is this idea of uh, a public-private venture that we entered into with uh, our housing in the Navy. We have uh, about 99% of our housing is in a public-private scheme where the Navy stepped out. We enter into 50-year leases with private companies. In many instances, because we would build a home at least cost, because that's how the government likes to budget. When you buy something, you go for the least cost. The public-private ventures are more interested in the lifetime costs over the 50-year term of their lease. And there were cases in Hawaii when we signed the agreement transferring uh, the, the houses into a public-private scheme. They brought bulldozers in and bulldozed them. Um, and built new because over the life of that lease they had, it was cheaper for them and more profitable for them, actually, uh, to go with less life cycle cost uh, than lease cost to build. So uh, we're seeing a transformation there. And oh, by the way, our people are now living in the best housing that the United States military has ever lived in because of that program. Uh, so those are just some of the initiatives that we have. I'm listening to a lot of long-term thinking that's having upfront costs but long-term saving. You have an acquisition pro process and a set of rules that come mm -hmm. from Congress. Is your acquisition process effective in dealing, particularly with the biofuels issue, uh, effective in, in allowing you to life cycle costs minimize rather than this first cost minimization? No. Um. And, and can you expand? <laughs> yeah. The, um, as I alluded to when I was talking about the housing issue, we buy based on the cost uh, of a unit. And uh, there will be lip service given to, yeah, we think about life cycle cost, but uh, in point of fact, that, that's not what goes on. Um, and, and I believe that until we inject into our procurement system, um, factors in the decision process that cause us to weight significantly the total ownership cost and the total ownership, and, and as a component of that, total energy cost over the expected life of that system, then we're going to continue to make um, very uh, 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 short-sighted decisions on procurement. Uh, again, we have to keep in mind that it's not, um, it's not just efficiency. At the end of the day, that which we buy has to go out and do the mission that we expect of it, uh, which means going into dangerous places, which means being able to provide uh, an offensive punch uh, that is uh, far superior to anything else that we might encounter. So we have to have that uh, in the equation, but we must absolutely get energy, long-term energy costs into that equation. Uh, and as I also mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we don't need massive power plants in many of our systems uh, to be in operation all the time. That's why the hybrid options to me were very attractive. But for example, uh, we are now in the process of dropping a hybrid drive into one of our high-end combatant ships, one of our guided missile destroyers that does air defense and missile defense. Uh, but it was easier for us to drop that into an older ship because I didn't have to change a shipbuilding contract to drop a new configuration into a new ship. When I, could, when I would argue that the best thing for me to be able to do would be to put this new technology, the cost savings in the ship that's going to be around long enough. So you know, those are the sorts of things that we need more than a cookie cutter approach to procurement to be able to factor that in. I would also submit that it's not just the service, but it goes up through the Department of Defense, through the administration, and then also into Congress, that we really need to think about energy in its entirety. Uh, there's an issue uh, within the Navy now. I talked about demonstrating this green fleet, which is operating off Hawaii as we speak. The, the desire was also, by 2016, to deploy a group of ships like that for six months. Excuse me, included in there 
is a large uh, purchase of biofuels. Um, the House uh, Armed Services Committee uh, trumped it, shut it off. The Senate, a little closer vote, a uh, very close vote in the Senate Armed Services Committee to stop or to not let the department use the money to buy that fuel. Um, you could argue uh, you've already demonstrated it. Uh, you're probably not going to shift the market, so don't use that money on fuel when you're going into some pretty constrained times. But I think a better solution would be to say, maybe not the best use of energy money. Let's take the money you were going to spend on that. And you know, we have some R&D projects in energy that didn't make the cut. Not that they weren't important, but they just didn't make the cut as, as the budget was being formulated. So why don't we shift the money into R&D and start moving out on some of the new technologies and new features that are going to be important in the future. And that has to happen all the way. Uh, and, and the cultural change that's required to do that is significant. Um, and and I, would, I would say that we need to look at energy not in the budget lines that budgeteers tend to look at them in, whether it's procurement or operation or R&D, but we need to look at energy, break it down, and then keep that money focused in energy so that we can move ahead. I'm going to want to turn to um, all of you to join the conversation in a moment, so I just have a question or two, but be formulating yours as we go ahead. But um, there's a lot of people here in high-tech industries. How can they get involved in this initiative? Are there yeah. good, good opportunities? I I, I fully understand that uh, dealing with the government can be a frustrating experience. Um, but my point is, uh, you know, don't, um, uh, don't get turned off by that. Uh, the, the focus that the services now have on energy is uh, at an all-time high, in my opinion. The budgetary pressures that the services are going to be experiencing are going to cause them to look for every single way that they can become more effective and efficient. Uh, the services have set up um, offices that deal more exclusively with energy than they ever have in the existence of the Republic. Um, and so, uh, you know, look for those opportunities. If you have technology that can apply, uh, whether it's on the shore infrastructure side or in mobile systems, whether they're airplanes or ships or vehicles, um, engage and, and, and just stay uh, focused on that because I really do believe that, that uh, we are at a point of time in the military where energy is something that there is and there has been a cultural change. And we have to take advantage of it because it's, it's going to cycle. We've seen it cycle before. And the opportunity now is to, is to move quickly, capitalize on it, bring in new technology, um, and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to jump over that valley of death that is the death of all of us when it comes time to introducing uh, new systems. But other if, if uh, people here want to get involved, and you mentioned how difficult it is sometimes dealing with the um, government, are there particular pitfalls that they should worry about as they're getting involved, or is it just yeah. go for it? I'd, I'd say go for it and uh, you know, let your patience meter run a little higher than it normally does as you're dealing with the government. Uh, one of the things that I would also say, and for those of you who are here, um, and I can't say enough about how impressed I was when I came to Hoover and the energy initiatives that are in place there through the Schultz-Stevenson Task Force. Um, and, and, the, and, and what was done by the task force to bring in the military, and a little bit of shameless hawking here, um, as a result of one of those seminars that was held at Hoover uh, that involved the Department of Defense, all of the services, um, there will soon be published by Hoover uh, a pamphlet called Powering the Armed Forces. Uh, it will be posted on the Hoover Energy Task Force uh, website, 
along with the transcript of all the discussions, uh, which is a f fairly significant uh, amount of, of uh, discussion. And in there, you will see how the services are viewing uh, the challenges, what they are seeking in the way of solutions, whether it's the Navy looking at uh, being able to move more quickly into biofuels, what I would call the ground forces priority of becoming lighter, because every soldier or Marine or any uh, uh, service man or woman who is running around the hills of Afghanistan or Iraq carries a lot of weight with them, much of which is there to provide power. Uh, the battery weight that a soldier carries or a Marine carries uh, on, a, on a long patrol, multi-day patrol, is about 70 pounds in batteries per person. Um, uh, as an aside, I happened to be in Iraq. I went into one of the field hospitals and expected to see a lot of our wounded soldiers and Marines there. And, and I saw a lot of people in the ward, and I started asking, you know, how are you doing? There were some nicks and cuts. Um, but most of the uh, people that were in there were for hernia operations. Um, and I'll let you figure out how they got them. But, uh, but you know, so the, just the, the ability to, instead of carrying tens of pounds of batteries, to slip a foldable solar panel in a pack makes a world of difference. Um, and, and so, you know, those are some areas that I think are going to be very important for the ground forces to be able to get in there, get lighter, be able to get into places and have power uh, generated in such a way that they're more sustainable, self-sustainable, and you don't have the risky uh, resupply going. Because the other thing that comes into it as well is, um, and this was a, another way of um, changing the culture, when we stop talking about how much it costs to purchase uh, fuel, and we started talking about the fully burdened cost of getting that fuel to a ship in the North Arabian Sea or getting it to a remote outpost on a mountain in Afghanistan, the price changes markedly. And, and it was a huge eye-opener. So as you look at energy initiatives that you may have, I would simply not look at the uh, cost of that which you may wish to provide uh, to the military, but rather look at how you are changing that fuel equation of fully burdened cost and survivability for the people that are using it because those factors will win an argument uh, pretty powerfully, I believe. Thank you. It's, it's time for questions. Um, uh, there's a lot of them. <coughs> the first hand I saw was Jeff's here. Thank you. Um, Jeff Byron. And, yeah. Good. I was just going to say everybody give their name first. But. Jeff Byron with the, uh, the Clean Tech Open. Um, Admiral Ruffhead, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, distinguished career. Thank you. Um, in fact, it's, it's, so, it's somewhat, of an, somewhat of an honor, I think, to just be amongst, I think, some of the greatest public servants of our generation, and I'd just like to acknowledge thank that. You. It's really nice to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, and of course, I didn't mean Jim Sweeney yet. <laughs> Good. Um, Admiral, you've kind of hinted at this. Um, Secretary Perry hinted at it when he talked about shale gas and mm -hmm. what a game changer that is. Would you, and, and I know you spoke here a couple of weeks ago with regard to uh, this issue, uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about the potential significance of the exploration of oil using these new techniques um, of drilling, just shale oil? And, I mean, given, given what, the, what our what your role has been, and that is to keep the spigot open mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this country in terms of access uh, to oil. How might that change things going forward? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Jeff. And I think that, uh, you know, as I've looked at, at keeping the spigot open, the amount of energy that we draw, for example, from the Middle East is not as great as others. Uh, we actually 
pull more from the Gulf of Guinea than we do from the Middle East, uh, which I think is it's important that we start thinking about energy in Africa. Um, that's going to be an issue, I think, 10 or 15 years from now. But uh, quite frankly, our presence in the Middle East, if, if you believe that it is about the energy source there, is really to enable that energy source to be used uh, by Asia, particularly our allies who need the energy, Korea, Japan, uh, and uh, Australia, China, huge user uh, as well, India, uh, also very, very dependent on, on Gulf energy as it comes out. So uh, until you start seeing things change uh, in, in Asia, I still think that we're going to be the guarantor of the flows of energy in the Middle East because, uh, you know, it, it may sound a bit arrogant, but nobody else can do it uh, other than the United States. Uh, we are the only nation that has that global presence, that global uh, capability to keep those flows going and to minimize any disruption. So I think we're there until you see the energy equation change in other parts of the world, or um, w you know, w we are unable to do it because of, of the size of the fleet or the size of the military uh, that we have. So I think we're going to be there for a while. That said, um, if the Arctic delivers um, in a way that it has the potential to uh, when it begins to clear, in fact, energy will start coming out of the Arctic before the transportation routes uh, are in. Uh, you know, will there be a change in the energy equation and will uh, you know, countries start pulling more from uh, the Arctic and using it? China is extremely focused on the Arctic, even though it's not an Arctic nation for trade, but I would also uh, submit that, that, that they're looking at the energy up there as well. So you'll see some changing patterns and will our presence diminish as a result of that. But that also means that there will likely be a need for us and the Ar other Arctic nations to have a presence in the Arctic that we don't have now. So what may not be in the Gulf may ship, shift around to, to the Arctic. I saw some questions. Um, if I understand your question correctly, um, you know, I would like to see our bases become, as I mentioned at a previous uh, event here, um, partners with states, with communities on developing uh, new ways of using and sharing that energy. I think you will also see the services moving more toward energy efficient vehicles to get to your line of work. Uh, we've already taken our recruiting command and started to put them in, into more energy efficient vehicles as they move around. Uh, so I think those are some of the things that may come into play. The, I'd like to take a, a minute and jump to something else that uh, your question triggered because of the business that you're in, and that is uh, we think in terms of uh, more energy efficient vehicles. I think folks here would uh, identify with that. But I believe that there's a game changing uh, uh, technology that will be very dependent on sources of safe, compact power. And those are underwater autonomous vehicles that need long duration, safe, compact power. Uh, if you believe that warfare has been changed by aerial drones, 
you haven't seen anything yet. Um, the potential for those autonomous underwater vehicles in the area of science, the environment, and in defense um, is extraordinary. And, and the problem that we have had is not in the communications uh, among, uh, between and among the vehicles. Uh, it is not necessarily in the short-term performance. It's all in the endurance. And so if you have any technologies that apply to safe, because we'll carry these things in our submarines and in our ships, um, long endurance, uh, high density, power, uh, that is going to be an area that, that has not come up on the scope, but it will uh, be a big deal, uh, I would say, starting in about five years, because there are some positive things that are happening, but that's an area where there are going to be some tremendous opportunities, not just in the defense area, uh, but in the exploration and the scientific uh, and the environmental areas of monitoring um, the water mass in different places. Thank you. Uh, looks like my eyes aren't as good as they. It looks like Mukesh there. Thank you very much, Mukesh, for the Oracle. Uh, Admiral, uh, this was very enjoyable, you know, very good presentation. And you have done a lot of battles with the uh, changes in the organization from technology, from policy, from culture. What advice would you give it to the private sector, to the industry, in how to adopt those changes, and especially to all of us who are not yet writing the checks? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things would be to bring industry and the government together because I would submit that if you sat in the meeting rooms of Washington as we're talking about energy, we hold you up as uh, the example of how it's being done faster than we are. Um, and so I think that a meeting of the minds would be good. Um, I believe that there are many technologies that exist particularly in, in, in uh, this area, uh, that the military is not aware of, uh, that, that will have application. And, and I believe that initiatives that bring uh, industry, technology, and the military together uh, just to, to have a common conversation uh, would be extraordinarily helpful. Great. Um, let's see. In, in the yellow sweater there, just Thank you. Uh, I'm Meredith Owens, Alameda Municipal Power. As a utility, our largest customer is the Maritime Administration. They have nine ships. Also, the Coast Guard is our, uh, probably our second largest customer. Uh, through our energy efficiency programs and services, we have uh, just completed a retrofit of one maritime ship, and we've started two more. On the one we just retrofitted, it was uh, lighting, energy management control systems, motors, and operations. We estimate energy efficiency savings of 30% or greater on this, mm -hmm. and we are doing individual metering. We're trying to get right. them to individual meter each ship. They move around. So uh, to that end, you talked about the uh, climate task force within the Navy. Mm -hmm. Admiral, do you see that task force generating um, shipbuilding codes that are concerned with energy efficiency? Uh, number one, I've heard some Coast Guard new, newly commissioned ships are coming in with some old fluorescent lighting and incandescent lights. So that's a bit disheartening. And number two, do you see any policies coming up um, in the military uh, requiring energy efficiency on existing facilities, particularly ships? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. I would say that, it, that that's all part of what the Energy Task Force was, was identifying, getting at, and, um, and, and what the, the Navy and, and the other services are mandating is to drive to uh, the sorts of changes that you're talking about. Uh, but as I alluded to, we still haven't really cracked into adjusting the procurement uh, codes because it's, in many instances, it's cheaper to not modify a contract and then retrofit the old technology, which, uh, it, you know, you would say it doesn't make sense. That's what I kept saying, it doesn't make sense. 
and I think we have to get in there and, and really uh, work with industry on, on ways to move forward. And, and I would also say that uh, congressional support can be very helpful in allowing us to have a different view of how we procure and how we, how we can change specifications. Um, I think that in many instances, and, and this was something that one of our great leaders in the Navy had taken on, uh, going in and actually reducing the number of requirements in the shipbuilding uh, procurement uh, requirements uh, to be able to get at some of these, these challenges. But I, I, I applaud what Marat is doing. Um, I, 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 the Coast Guard recently has put more of their procurement within the umbrella of the Navy because we have the folks that do that for a living. So I'm hopeful that you'll see some commonality coming out because I would submit that for Marad to pursue, to pursue new tech, shipboard technology, Coast Guard to pursue shipboard technology, Navy to pursue shipboard technology, if we're doing it in three separate lanes, we're not doing it uh, very effectively or efficiently, and, and that needs to be brought together. Great. Um, in the white shirt there. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I'm Philip von Guggenberg. I work with SRI International, a technology powerhouse. We do a lot of work with the US government uh, contract work. Um, my question is uh, around the role of robotics in increasing the efficacy and efficiency of the operations on ships. You have, of course, mentioned already the UAVs, which is one solution. But I'm also interested in the, you know, how you look at robotics in terms of the larger ships and even the possibilities of, uh, you know, significantly reducing the number of people on the ships in favor of teleoperated or autonomous ro robots. Yeah. I think, um, you know, for example, um, and it may not completely uh, uh, cover the ro just the robotics area. But on our newest uh, aircraft carrier, we've taken 800 people off of that ship. Um, in the new class of combatant ship that we are building called the Littoral Combat Ship, uh, a ship of that tonnage in the past would have had about 250 people on it. We're now down to a crew of 40. Um, they're, they're very busy 40 people, I can tell you that much. Um, <laughs> But, um, but, I, but, but how you are able to do uh, the heavy physical activity that required manpower uh, and using uh, automated systems, robotics. Uh, you know, for example, we are uh, in the Navy developing uh, a, a uh, drone, a, a UAV, that can land and take off from an aircraft carrier. When an airplane lands on an aircraft carrier now and you have to get it out of the landing pattern, which is a relatively uh, small area of deck space, uh, the pilot will be told where to go. Uh, how do you tell a drone where to taxi? So um, instead of, um, uh, you know, a lot of people pushing it around, there's an umbilical that hooks in and, and drives it around with one person. So uh, I, th I think there are those issues. We are also... Um, uh, and I go back to the underwater world, uh, looking at not just the vehicles that swim, but underwater robotics that crawl, uh, that m can be deposited by UAV or UUV, maybe picked up. And so this whole idea of uh, robotics is going to be significant. And of course, uh, again, I keep coming back to the combat experiences that we've had over the last 10 years, robots that can perform logistics functions, uh, robots that can, um, in, a, in a small outpost, can do a lot of the heavy lifting of supplies that are dropped so you're not you know, using up uh, and, and applying your manpower to that. So I think, again, this takes me to the, you know, the, that we're in a, in a period of time where new technologies are going to be much easier adopted. And so I would encourage uh, initiatives that you may have uh, bringing them to the attention of the, of the various services wherever they may fit in. Great. All good things must come to an end. And I want to thank our speaker. Uh, th this hour went very, okay. very fast. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Gary. Thank you.